So, uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for for uh, sticking with us to this point in the day. It's been a pretty pretty exciting day pretty so exciting far. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. Lots of lots of things going on. So we constantly hear from customers that they need better interoperability between their SaaS applications. And so, as David noted earlier today. Uh, some of those, some some customers use something called an integration platform as a service, or IPaaS, as a lot of us know it, um, to create some of those connections. And we at we at AWS even have a service like that called AppFlow. And we we uh, we have customers that use that to create pipelines between big applications like their ERP systems and, and their data lake stored in S3 or maybe their data warehouse stored in Amazon Redshift. Um, and that's, a, that's great for those technology builders who want to control every aspect of the data flow. Uh, they can create those one-to-one -one connections really well and create them exactly the way that they want them. But we also, as, as you've heard from us today, we, we've heard from customers that they, they have that, that separate set of applications that don't necessarily, they don't necessarily need to control the data flow the same way that they have. And that's why we created uh, AWS App Fabric. And so we heard from, because we heard from a lot of these customers that uh, working with, uh, with uh, those iPads facilitated connections it can be kind of a heavyweight project. And it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily translate well to the longer tail of SaaS applications. And so for most of those customers, we wanted, we wanted to uh, create this different way, this, this easier way to, to integrate those applications. And so, Fetty, I, I wanted you to talk to us a little bit more about how we're creating those connections with App Fabric and, and, and what makes, that, makes it feasible to connect with a broader set of applications and like what's fundamentally different about this architecture? Sure. Uh, we've heard it extensively today. When we look at companies, it's very typical for organizations to have over 100 applications deployed on their application stack. We've heard it from David, Dilip touched on it, and then Alex Hood and, and others throughout the day. And integrations typically are being built to facilitate data flow exchanges across uh, apps in their stack. But integrations are there for a purpose and typically are for enabling business processes. Uh, companies um, of all sizes um, ultimately rely on, and we also looked at with Dr. Hines earlier today, we rely on technology to enable workflows, to enable business processes. And we've seen companies ranging even north over 10,000 and plus uh, business processes that ultimately would trigger notifications, alarm. And so to your point, Robbie, like, well, there are very valid and specific cases for uh, when companies want to observe and look at the data flows, um, like hydrating a data lake, for example, or feeding off from an ERP system into some form of storage solution to do then analytics on top of it. Um, those are very valid use cases for an iPads. Uh, but I think historically what we've also noticed is that customers have told us when they then move away from uh, applications that are very much tailored for iPaaS uh, and point-to-point -point integration type solutions, um, they encounter a scalability issue. Mm -hmm. And so if we now think about having to replicate these connections across the entire portfolio and an entire application stack, then it becomes not only difficult or complex to, to, to build, but then there is the management side of things. And it also requires a very specific skill set. Uh, if you will, it's like looking at this from the lens of um, it requires a builder to understand how to go about taking, you mentioned outflow, of, you know, fully managed service and enable this bidirectional data flow to enable, in this case, an ERP and a data warehouse solutions to to connect with one another. And then I try and extend that to a world where now you have hundreds of these applications that needs to be connected with one another. And in the middle of it, there also needs to be an element of orchestration and trying to enable not just data flowing, but also insights and taking actions across all these applications. And so um, another challenge that customers have told us in trying to extend uh, an ipas based solutions to the world of SaaS applications is it boils down to also to the lack of standardization that exists, not only data model. We saw it with Pratim and Tamar earlier today as we looked into the work we've done um, for uh, uh, enhancing security observability across the application stack with the OCSF schema. 
but also on an API level, like API definitions, as we're thinking about enabling data flows to take actions across all these applications, all those APIs also require an element of normalization, which doesn't exist today. Mm -hmm. um, and so really, the, as we think about the application of AWS of Fabric, it's really around trying to think and working backwards from the different personas that we're, we're addressing for. And, and customers have told us that they would love for us to abstract this integration layer altogether. Yeah. And so you think it's fair to, to say that that, um, that AppPirate kind of provides this, this layer of abstraction of that integration with, uh, with you know, uh, that's sort of complementary to iPaaS? Oh, absolutely. And I think the two really very much co-live together, to your point. They are very complementary. Um, with AWS of Fabric, we're getting applications that were not designed together to actually work better together, not just exchange data with one another. And I think that's a key differentiator that we've covered today. We've seen some functional demos that, that brought that point across. Um, we've heard of companies like Optibus, who's a transportation company that helps city run fleets more efficiently. And they're a digital native business. You know, David talked about them. We review them also in other sessions. And it's, it's a company, it's a customer, it's club first. And even then, they told us that they've been able to use AWS of Fabric to quickly accelerate, and, and the same with Bank Leumi, to ultimately plug in new applications through AWS of Fabric and enhance the productivity of, of their security teams. Mm -hmm. And so as, as we think about like how we extend that, so, so we've talked with a lot of, with our customers about, and, and with different partners about generative AI in their SaaS applications. And, and we're still in the very, very early days of that technology. But I think it's really fundamentally going to change the way that we think about this application stack and how we're interacting, how you and I and all the folks in the room and online are interacting with applications that we're using. Um, and so, uh, you know, like and we've talked with a lot of other product leaders around the industry that, that have ideas, but right now a lot of those are just ideas. And uh, what, do you think are the, what do you think are the most valuable uses of Gen AI that we can see right now in these applications? Yeah, and, and you're right. We've had a lot of conversations with uh, builders as well as customers. And... Um, I think there is a general consensus that generative AI can unlock novel experiences. Mm -hmm. But as we think about and we help our customers to define what is their generative AI strategy, it all boils down to uh, the fundamental premise that their AI strategy and their generative AI strategy in particular really needs to sit on top of uh, uh, valuable data. And this data exists today. They have it in their stack. It's just siloed. And so one of the fundamental premises with AWS of Fabric is that by breaking down the data silos across all these applications, we then empower and enriching what ultimately is and can be um, a very successful uh, generative AI strategies for companies. And then as, as we started having these conversations, what we then uh, noticed is we started uh, engaging with CIOs and trying to understand, okay, what are some of the typical questions the CIO asks when it comes to generative AI strategies and unlocking value out of the data? Um, and, um, one, of the, one of the themes that came out is that um, CEOs are telling us that security is a main concern. And so how do we think about uh, providing them this security first approach that David touched upon as we described some of the tenets that we've used to build the service. But then from there, what are some of the use cases? And so specifically for their companies, for their employees, how can... Um, uh, CIOs enable their companies and their employees to be more productive in executing these multiple workflows that we talked about. Uh, because at the end of the day, remember, like integrations and breaking down data silos has to have a purpose for the business. Right. And and this is one of the things that we've worked. Uh, it's very typical of Amazon in terms of working backwards from a customer specific use cases that we can enable with the service. Um, there is uh, there is an entire suite of use cases that uh, that we haven't yet touched yeah. in terms of the application of generative AI. I think everybody in this room online can relate to conversational experiences. And it's really hard for me as, as, as a product person to believe that 
um, one size fits all. Mm -hmm. and, and while that is a very relevant use case, a very relevant modality of interface with some of these generative AI capability unlocked through foundation models, um, it's really difficult for me to believe that that experience um, is going to be the right modality of interface across every possible uh, use case. And so my perspective is that, and the perspective of many other uh, product leaders and companies uh, is that there are very few moments of discontinuous change that can really um, uh, present a rare opportunity to completely reimagine customer experiences. And this is one of them. I think we've seen through the demos today some examples on how we are working backwards from feedback from our customers and they're telling us the world rebooted two years ago. Um, meetings are part of our everyday life and so we have to work together to try and reimagine what that experience looks like. And that's one of the great examples that we use for the WSF Fabric that I believe many of us can relate to in terms of how can we bring some of these capabilities, some of these so the, the, the fundamental abstraction of the integration layer to unlock these novel use cases, this new modality of interface where you don't have to, uh, you don't have to leave uh, your meeting experience. Uh, I think earlier we talked about, and Alex talked about having accountability into meetings. I think it's a very powerful statement. Um, and it's a mon mental model shift on how we think about user experiences overall across all the applications. Yeah, and I love that point about like, we, we, we just don't know how every person works. And I think that's one of, the, one of the things that this can bring to bear for us is making our applications work better for right. each one of us, adapt a little bit more to our own work style. Um, and you know, I can, I, I can certainly identify with, with some of the customers that I've talked with that, you know, that say, you know, they, they have problems with, when they're having conversations. So like, uh, I'm having a meeting, let's say, and I, I, like I'm, I'm t we're talking about a particular thing. I, I remember a piece of content or a conversation or something that would be really relevant and really pertinent right then, but I'm searching through my Slack messages and I'm searching through my email and I, and I can't find that artifact. I can't find that thing that would be really helpful. And uh, having that appear and having that show up for me at the right time, in the right place, in a relevant context, would have been really helpful. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, that's part of the promise. That's like the, one of the first use cases that that's we can right. see there. But as we, as, we, as we implement those kinds of things and we have them available and we imagine what could happen next, I'm just really excited about what it what it could actually do for us. And, and I relate to that as well. I think I think there is a hidden story in there, which is you search for the purpose of doing something. Rarely you search just for the sake of searching and obtaining information. I think it's a mental model shift really around how to think about the abilities of some of these foundation models where you're not necessarily treating them as knowledge stores. Mm -hmm. But I think the way we, are, we apply into the use case that we unlock with AWS Subfabric is really around using their ability to reason yeah. so that they can provide what's the natural next action to take without you having to go through that cognitive overload of trying to think of what is the next action that I need to take. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a really important point to, uh, you know, in the way that we think about the technology is, you know, this, that contrast with, with what we've had before when we're thinking, like, for example, strictly in terms of search and all the big indexes and things that need to happen for conventional search and how this is really a fundamentally different change when we think about LLMs and, and the way that we can use those. And like very different even than, even than what we're hearing today about LLM applications in the consumer space. I mean, it's a, so it's that, it's that contrast from what we've got today and, and the art of the possible for what we can see going forward. Yeah, and that's absolutely right. I think, I think there is an interesting question, almost another question that comes in. Um, so with AWS a Fabric, what we do is we augment that context. And, and there are ways you can augment the context. So in the case of a, of, a, of a meeting, again, we can all relate to that. You have transcriptions that provide you a clear specification of what's the intent, what's happening, what's the context of that conversation. You could have uh, um, 
in the case of a communication app or a messaging app, you could have an experience where you can extract the intent and the conversations to feed into ultimately the prompt. It becomes a lot more interesting when you try to think about, okay, well, what, what if I don't have that? Mm -hmm. And so then how do I detect what is it the user is trying to do so that I can proactively suggest what's the natural next action for you, what's the natural next aggregation of information that makes sense for you and the next steps that you can take. And how do we break down this digital exhaustion that Dr. Heinz talked about earlier? Um, ultimately, um, we have to ground uh, the reasoning abilities of large language models into the context of of the companies, right? And so this is a big part of what we do uh, with the WSF Fabric that we've shown uh, with the demo earlier, earlier today. And it's a critical component in terms of um, how do we enable some of these novel interfaces and novel experiences. Yep, I think that's exactly right. And so in, enriching, uh, uh, one of the things that we, we hear is that enriching that, that context with customer data is going to be really important. So let's talk about how we protect customer data privacy when, when we do that within uh, some of these applications that we're talking about here. And uh, you know, how do we take data that's flowing from SaaS apps into App Fabric and then to the App Fabric AI layer? And what, what privacy controls do we have in place to ensure that customers' data isn't compromised? Uh, I think so. So the customer data remains private. Uh, and again, IWS of Fabric is a fully managed service that's deployed onto a customer account. And so um, we have uh, an ability through IWS of Fabric to, um, to ground the experience so that now customers have full control over, right? So that whatever then it surfaces into their app of choice is actually relevant to them. Mm -hmm. The second piece to this is that, and that's, I think we, we talked a little bit this, about this earlier in the session, the way we're thinking about the product is we want to provide flexibility to customers to actually uh, define what is it they want AWS of Fabric to um, automate on their behalf. And so again, we're going to put as part of our tenet around which we've built AWS of Fabric while meeting users where they are, we also want to make sure that they're in full control around the security layer that's pervasive across uh, AWS and specifically to, to App Fabric. Um, and uh, the, the engagements that we have with customers have been, so far has been extremely positive in terms of brainstorming what are some of the use cases where they do want to bring AWS App Fabric to. And just last, last week, on June 22nd, we announced, we announced the Generative AI Innovation Center for this exact purpose, where we're really trying to enable customers with solutions architect, uh, data scientist, uh, AI strategies, to really try and understand how do we build a powerful general AI strategy on top of your data that has gravity, and it's critical in order to inform these intelligent experiences. Um, so that we can then apply AWS of Fabric, Bedrock, and many of our other AI and ML services to serve uh, to serve their use cases. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So what what are CIOs telling us, and and how like if you were giving some advice to a CIO, how would you tell them to orient themselves in in a really fast moving landscape around Gen AI? I think you have to ground it in, the theme is you have to ground it around um, what is the use case you're trying to enable. Just earlier today, I was having a conversation with, uh, with a customer, a prospective customer in, in healthcare industry. And so some of the conversation for the healthcare industry is very different from types of conversations we're having in a transportation industry. And so I think nailing down the use case is particularly important. Again, this is where having this uh, uh, support from a broad range of specialists across AWS that we're making them available through our uh, Generative AI Innovation Center is going to be critical to accelerate the pace of innovation, the clip at which customers can innovate using our services. And look, uh, we launched SageMaker um, a few years back. We have over 100,000 customers that are actively using SageMaker to have built uh, intelligent experience on it. Um, we really believe this is really just the beginning. Uh, and we, we feel like with AWS Sub Fabric, we're just scratching the surface of some of the use cases that we can unlock through generative AI. Yeah, and I'm really excited about what we're going to see come out of that generative AI uh, innovation center. 
and, the, and how customers are going to innovate with that. So, you know, it is clearly just day one, and there's a lot of opportunity out there. I'm excited to see how all that plays so out. So am I. I think uh, so is uh, the entire company, our customers, and AWS partners alike that have embarked with us in this service. Great. And I want to invite James to come back up here, see if we've got any questions from the, from the chat that we think might be helpful or questions in the room. Happy to take those as well. Uh, yeah, we have, there's two, two that came in so far, but anyone that has any questions, welcome to come up to the microphones. Um, one of them that was asked was, uh, again, generative AI. Uh, it's known that LLMs, large language models, can be prone to what are known as hallucinations and uh, provide incorrect data. Um, how are you addressing this issue in the Gen AI that is going to be used in App Fabric? Yeah, uh, look, uh, the risks are real. Uh, again, Alex mentioned this earlier today, uh, Alex Dunlop mentioned this today. Um, it is uh, not a new technology for AWS. We've been uh, using LLMs for many years across many use cases and many applications. But to your point, um, the risks are real. And we have promising findings in terms of some of the applications for hallucination detectors. And uh, we've developed a number of other approaches that involve prompt injection detections to understand uh, how can we control the risk. But uh, indeed, um, a lot of how these hallucinations uh, apply very much depends on the use case itself. And so the, the right approach and the right mix of uh, approaches to de-risk the occurrences of very much depends on how we're applying generative AI models to what use case. And so I, I, it's really there is no one size fits all. There is no one solutions. Um, that's kind of the holy grail for it. Yeah, that makes sense. There's always, there's never, if only there was a one size fits all, then that would make your life easier, of course. Um, one more question that came in was, um, SaaS applications frequently have uh, a handful of connection integrations already built into themselves already by the SaaS providers. Um, when it comes to connecting SaaS apps on a larger scale, uh, why don't SaaS providers continue to build those connections themselves as opposed to App Fabric doing that? Yeah, I think, I think you, know, you can add to this if you want to, Fetty, but what we've heard pretty consistently is those, those connections between SaaS applications for, for each of those vendors are things that just take time away from other places where they could be innovating in their business. And so if, if we can create, as we have with AppFabric, this central place that they can integrate with, they only have, the SaaS providers only have to uh, build and support that one integration, and then they have all, of, you know, all this breadth of capability across all these other applications. And so they can then spend that time focused on their core mission, like the, the core thing that their application does, rather than like, does my application work with this other application, with that other application? And, and so we think it's gonna create even faster innovation uh, in, the, in the, like the wheelhouse of each of those applications. I think that's right. I think what I what I go back to, and you know, somebody thinks about point-to-point -point integrations. The integrations are there for a purpose. And so, almost again, working backwards for what is the use case that these point-to-point -point integrations, these SaaS applications, are trying to address through these integrations, and and then to Robbie's point. Uh, oftentimes, the answer boils down to that there are experiences that these uh, independent software developers are focusing on where they could focus 80% of their time. And now we're abstracting away the need to even think about these integrations because all these applications that were not built to work together actually work better together through the rest of Fabric. Yeah, that's what I mean. It always comes back to one of the things we always talk about is the removing the undifferentiated heavy lifting. And that just sounds like that's just yet another part of it. You know, allow the SaaS apps to focus on what differentiates themselves, makes them better. That's right. And leave the connections to just one. Okay. Awesome. Uh, well, that was all that came in for me. Uh, thank you, Robbie and Federico. If anyone else has any questions, no? Great. Great. Thanks, thank you. Well, thank you, guys. <laughs>